Welcome back to News Talk. We're continuing our conversation now on Northern Virginia's transportation proposals with Marty Noe and Nancy Heitschu. And uh, we want to welcome your calls, your questions, your comments. Contact us on our news line, 703-387-1020. During this 10 o'clock hour, we will include you in the conversation. So I want to talk to you about new transportation initiatives right. and, and the reality that could be in, in a y few years or even a decade or right. so that we could see driverless cars. Uh, and your survey actually asked right. people about this. What, what did people say about it? Well, I, I think there's a lot of interest and a lot of expectation, frankly, about new technology changing the way we commute around the region. Um, you know, Ten years ago, the concept of a driverless car truly was science fiction. A few weeks ago, a driverless car was tested on the I-95 express lanes in real time. Um, this is something that Google is telling us will be a reality um, in many parts of the country within five years. So as we update our long-range regional plan for Northern Virginia, we have to be thinking about these changes in paradigm. How will driverless cars fit into this transportation network? How will services like Uber that make it possible for some people to not have to own cars change the way we think about how we get from point A to point B? And um, as we look at the long-range plan, we have to make sure that we're truly thinking about what the world will be like when that plan is realized, not just the way we'd like it to be based on today's expectations. More than half of those surveys say they would be interested in trying this technology when it's right. available in the marketplace. I wonder if there will be unintended consequences with this. You know, instead of riding in a metro car, you could ride in your own car, sit back and read, hypothetically. We don't know exactly how it's going to work, but could this result in more congestion? That's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, the technology is so new. I mean, the cars aren't available, so um, your guess is as good as mine I, in that respect. Um, I will say, you know, it certainly is interesting as we, you know, talk about driverless cars, you know, the impact of um, just driver behavior on congestion today. You know, what impact will a driverless car have on, you know, those cut and sudden stoplights that you see for no reason? A lot of the um, congestion is dri drivers slowing down, just general driver behavior issues, and will right. that improve it? We, accidents exactly. Might be less we, don't, we don't know. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, it's certainly interesting. Um, Sometimes technology is really interesting. I think we celebrated the anniversary of the Back to the Future show a few weeks ago and thinking of what that movie predicted and what it didn't, I think this is a step towards those movie predictions. Um, so it's just a, the future is interesting, certainly gets more complicated. But if the technology, if Google's right, five years is not far off. I mean, that, that in terms of funding initiatives, you often are thinking in, in five or ten year terms. So and sometimes 25 year terms. Right. And how much of this current funding then should be set aside to invest in the future in that technology if there is infrastructure that needs to go in? Well, what, we, what we're starting to see is that um, the paradigm that's emerging for things like driverless cars is that that new technology will have to be a scalable to fit within the existing infrastructure. I think there's been talk about concepts of, of you know, cars that connect to each other and become trains along the roadway. The roads aren't designed for that. So it's going to have to be that the new technology is in the vehicle, not in the roadway. Eventually, you'll be linking those two together. But where we start is by having the technology fit the existing uh, space rather than having the space to adapt to the technology. So we can continue to move forward with, again, improvements to Route 7, improvements to Route 50. But we have to remember that there will always be a demand for metro. There will always be a demand for basic highways. And I think that what will happen is that our behaviors will change as the technologies will change, but both of them will have to uh, be built on the fact that we have things already in place that we're not in a position to get rid of and that no one really wants to replace. We've already talked a lot about widening roadways, the yeah. major roadways, and how this money should be funneled into those projects, but often you some times get uh, pushback from advocates for mass transit, for public sure. transit, who say, instead of widening a, a highway or a roadway, let's put that money into making metro rail work better or expanding metro services. So how much of this funding is, uh, how much of a balance should there be between those two factors? Well, you know, transit is a, an important and critical component of our regional network. You know, it, um, I think 
it's about 78% of the um, traveling public is by automobiles. The remainder of that is made up by transit service as well as the bike and pedestrian. So it's about 32% of the public utilize some form of other transportation. Um, and certainly Metro Rail um, and their you know, safety and you know, continued safe operations is critical to the growth of our region. Um, but an important at component of any transit system is also a bus network. Um, fixed rail can only go so far whereas a bus has limited, limitless possibilities of routes. Um, but they also drive on the same roads that cars do as well. Um, so when you're putting money in for highway improvements, it's, those aren't just serving the automobile driving community, but also the transit community as well. But certainly investments in our fixed rail systems are, are also important. Do you think the minority of commuters who ride the bus are going to be represented in these transportation funding decisions? Well, they need to be. And, and as we kick off um, the, the big update to our regional transportation plan, the, the transaction plan, um, we're really working very hard to try to get as much input from every type of commuter that we can. The money that we're spending is exclusive to Northern Virginia, so Northern Virginians need to be part of, of deciding what our top priorities are. I like to say that no one wants to take the bus, no one wants to take Metro, no one wants to drive their car. What they want is to get to work in the morning and get home to their families faster at the end of the day. How they do it is an individual decision that's made based on what's available to them. And what we've heard, and, and to no surprise, is that there's a lot of frustration about none of the options working as well as people would like them to. So. Uh, getting out and talking to people. We're, you know, we're not just going to have town hall meetings as we update our plans. Um, we're literally sending people out to farmers markets and high school back to school nights. Um, we're, we're using, again, talk about new technology. There's going to be a lot of crowdsourcing and, and use of social media to give everyone the opportunity to give us, in many cases, real-time feedback on how best we can improve people's commutes. Now, of course, getting the information about what people want and need is one thing. Figuring out how to turn those needs into realities is going to take a little bit of time, but the good news is I think the commitment's been made by the Commonwealth to allow Northern Virginia to control its own destiny moving forward. Nancy, you mentioned that, that your organization liked the innovative approach that the McAuliffe administration had for 66 inside the Beltway, although you don't necessarily agree with all of that proposal, but what more could be done, not just on 66, but across the region to encourage carpooling, to encourage slugging, because ultimately as this region grows, you can you can expand all the roadways all you want. You're, you're going to have more and more cars. Right. Right. You know, I think the you mentioned slugging. The slugging culture on the 95 corridor, you know, kind of grew out of onto himself. Uh, the need for drivers to be able to get to kind of a centralized location. Um, but our workforce pat and our employment patterns around the region are changing. We're no longer in one core area. Um, we are in Tyson's Corner and Dallas and Reston and Springfield and still in D.C. and Arlington, but we're spreading out around the region. And so it does make slugging and, and carpooling more, more challenging. Um, I think that the state is developing a lot of programs as well as the authority um, and the trans transit commissions around the region and getting information out to the, dri to the driving public and the commuting public on what options are out there. Um, and, you know, but but a lot of that is people's willingness to put another person in their car, too. Do you think it's an infrastructure challenge of having a space for cars to pull off and pick people up, or is it a financial incentive issue that there should be some way to incentivize people to, to have strangers in their car or get in the car of a stranger? Well, there's some of that, uh, some of both. Um, you know, we look at what's been done at some key hubs. The Pentagon's a great example where, you know, over the years, they've, had, they've really reconfigured what we think of as their parking lot to largely be a transit center as much as anything else. Um, you've got places like the Mark Center, which is a building where they deliberately underbuilt the parking capacity, sort of forced people to ride, share, or take transit. But we then have to make sure as a regional body that we provide the infrastructure that allows that transit or that ride sharing to take place. I think slugging is a really great example because in so many parts of the country they have no idea what it is. It's something that sort of grew organically here in Northern Virginia because of need. Um, it was a great example of citizens saying, this is what we're going to do to make our own lives better. And I think there's other things. We're going to see more and more of that, um, not because the government's going to say, you must slug, but because people are going to realize it's a better way for them to get from A to B. And we're seeing rideshare companies like Lyft and Uber moving in that direction, Absolutely. Uh, splitting, splitting fares with, among riders and, and hopefully reducing some congestion. Absolutely. And, and, and part of the solution has to be things that we've struggled with. You know, we talk a lot about telecommuting, but telecommuting is going to have 
have to be part of our long-term solution. That's not something that I as a government agency or, or Nancy as an advocacy group can force people to do, but I think that we can encourage employers to make it easier for um, their workers to telework, um, stay at home on some days. Um, we had a suggestion a few years ago coming out of the Alliance, Nancy's organization, saying that any day that's a code red day for, uh, for, uh, you know, for health and air quality should be treated like a snow day. The federal government should tell people, if it's, too hot, if it's too cold outside, stay home. If it's too hot outside, stay home too. That's the kind of thinking that I think we need more of. Marty Noe, Nancy Heitschu, thank you both for your insight and your time today. Glad to be here. Thank you. We're back with more News Talk right after this.